Wildlife, Chapter 3 Four days later, Eric was on a plane to Chicago. It was only the first leg of the day-long journey he'd been dreading. When he'd told Patrick and Mr. Holt that he couldn't go hunting with them because he was going to North Dakota, Mr. Holt had tried to cheer him up. "'You lucky son of a gun,' he'd said. "'I've always wanted to go out there. The pheasant hunting is fantastic. It's a bird hunter's paradise.' When Eric and Patrick had pointed out that Eric didn't own a gun himself, or a dog, either, for that matter, Mr. Holt had shaken his head with sympathy. That's a darn shame, Eric, and I'm really sorry you won't be coming with us on Saturday. But we'll go next year. You can count on it. Which didn't make Eric feel the least bit better. Mr. Holt gave Eric some of his hunting magazines with articles that featured North Dakota. Now, on the plane, Eric pulled them out of his backpack and tried to read, but he couldn't concentrate on the words. When the batteries in his computer game died, he fidgeted. Tapping his foot and drumming his fingers on the tray table, he watched the people around him and wondered how they could stand sitting still for so long. Weren't their legs twitchy? Didn't they want to jump up and move around the way he did? He took the items from the seat pocket in front of him and examined the barf bag, the woman beside him gave him a worried smile and asked if he'd like her to get up so he could visit the bathroom. Embarrassed, he said no, returned the bag to the pouch, and tried to keep his body still. More embarrassing was the fact that he had been escorted on and would be escorted off the plane by a flight attendant, as if he were a little kid. Even worse than that, he had to wear a badge with U.M. on it, which stood for Unaccompanied Minor. He tried to entertain himself by thinking up other things the letters could represent, like Ugly Moron, Upchuck Midget, Unbalanced Madman, and Unusual Mammal. This amused himself, this amused him long enough, so that he chuckled to himself, causing the woman beside him to give him another worried glance. He stared down at his lap, willing the flight would be over. After Chicago, he flew to Fargo, North Dakota and from there to Minot, in a plane so small he felt like it was on an amusement park ride. He spent the whole trip looking out the window at the ground below, trying to make sense of what he was seeing. Then he realized that he was actually trying to make sense of what he wasn't seeing. Where was everything? Maybe he thought they were too high in the air for normal things like roads and houses and stores to be visible. But no, that wasn't it. Because every once in a while he did see a building or a road. They sure looked to be few and far between. When the plane was about to land, Eric was astonished to see five jackrabbits hop off the runway. While he thought that was pretty funny and he liked seeing them, he couldn't help wondering if he'd come to a place with more rabbits than people. Mino, he'd learned from the, air from the airport loudspeaker, rhymed with, Why not? As he got off the plane and walked across the windy tarmac into the airport, he could think of a lot of reasons why not. At the end of the long hall leading from the airport gate, a tall man wearing jeans and a John Deere cap stood waiting beside a small, thin woman who reminded Eric of a nervous little bird. Even from a distance, when the intense blue of the man's eyes was the intense blue of the man's eyes was striking. Eric drew closer, and the woman's face broke into an anxious smile. He could read her lips as she said, That's him. The man's face showed no expression. Eric knew these people must be his grandparents, but he didn't feel related to them at all. His mother had told him to greet them with a hug, but instead he hugged his backpack to his chest as he approached. Eric Anders Carlson, is that you? the woman asked. All at once, Eric felt panicky and thought about shaking his head and walking past, but then what? He nodded. Thank the Lord, I was worried you wouldn't make it with all those stops you had along the way. Why, I could barely make head or tail of that itinerary your mama sent. She said the word itinerary carefully, Eric noticed, as if perhaps she were saying it out loud for the first time. Well, now say hello to your grandfather. Hi. Eric hesitated, embarrassed. His birthday cards were always signed Oma and Big Daryl. 
Well, he could imagine addressing his somber man, this somber man as Sir. He couldn't bring himself to say Big Daryl to the man's face. But his grandmother was urging, go ahead, call him Big Daryl. Everybody does. Hello, Big Daryl, Eric said. Big Daryl cleared his throat. Eric, he said in a voice filled with gravel. How can people call you that? Eric asked him. But Big Daryl had already turned away and was heading for the baggage claim area. Eric wished he could call the question back. It was Oma who answered, as she and Eric followed Big Daryl through the light crowd of people. It's on account of at the school he went to, there were two Daryls, she explained. Can you imagine in a one-room school with twelve children on a good attendance day, two Daryls? Anyway, tall like he is, he was the big one. Oh. They waited in silence for Eric's suitcases to come around on the carousel, and then he followed his grandparents out of the terminal. They sat in, they sat in the front seat of a beat-up-looking red pickup truck, Eric in the middle. His grandmother patted his hand and told him to call her Oma. That's how our people do. It stands for Old Ma, she said. Then she gave a dry little laugh and added, And I expect I'm old enough. She pointed her thumb and said, he, He'd be Opa for Old Pa, if he wasn't Big Daryl. Eric glanced out the corner of his eye at Big Daryl, who stare, started the engine, looking straight ahead, his face set. Eric wondered what he had done to make Big Daryl mad. He'd just arrived. How could he have done anything wrong? As they drove through Minot, he was relieved to see a lot of the same fast food places he was accustomed to seeing at home, as well as a mall and, and a theater, showing eight different movies. But when they left the city behind, driving farther and farther west, the world out the window looked more and more unfamiliar. There was so much empty space, so much sky, so much nothing. He could see really, really far, but there wasn't anything to see as they drove along what had to be the longest, straightest, flattest road in the country. Nothing except for mile after mile of flat brown prairie and corn and sunflower fields so big they seemed to never end. Every once in a while, there was a grain silo or a broken down old white church with a tall steeple or things that looked to Eric like big metal dinosaurs bending over to drink, leaning back to swallow and bending over to drink again. Oma explained that they were rigs to pump oil out of the ground. Fires burned beside some of them, sending flames shooting into the open air. Ma Oma said they were new rigs that were burning off excess methane gas. The fires looked eerie, sending their heat up into the sky. North Dakota appeared every bit as foreign and desert-like to Eric as pictures of Iraq and Afghanistan he'd seen on TV. After they'd been driving for three and a half hours, he couldn't help wondering if they were going to the very end of the world. It had been the end for lots of people. Eric, had, Eric could see that. There seemed to be more abandoned houses slowly sinking into the prairie than there were ones that were inhabited. Squished between Big Daryl and Oma on the truck seat, he felt oddly tired and wired at the same time. Even if he had felt relaxed enough to doze off, he was sure the rattle and whistle of the truck's windows would have woken him. The wind seemed to him like some sort of crazed creature that was trying to tear its way inside the cab. Dust, and he could hardly believe it, actual tumbleweeds raced across the highway with nothing to stop them in all that wide openness. Oma knitted and Big Daryl drove, both of them seeming content to pass the ride without talking. Eric wasn't used to this and it made him uncomfortable. In a momentary lull in the shriek of the wind, he blurted, Where are all the people? Neither of his grandparents spoke for a minute. Then Oma said, Busy doing the things people do. Her voice trailed off vaguely, and she gave a small shrug. No, Eric said. I mean, how come there aren't any people? Or hardly any houses or any stores or any anything? Oma blinked. Why? I expect it looks different here than it does in New York, she said, but there are people. You'll see. A while later, Eric asked, how much longer until we get there? Oh, another hour or so, said Oma. He tried not to groan. 
The day seemed endless. He'd never sat still for so long in his life. After what seemed much more than an hour, Big Darrell turned off the highway by a sign whose paint had peeled so badly Eric had to squint hard to make out what it said. Fortuna, North Dakota. You'll love it here. Painted around the words were four pictures. A motorhome, a cow, a tractor, and a pheasant. The sight of the pheasant cheered Eric for a couple of seconds until he remembered that tomorrow he was supposed to be home hunting actual pheasants with Patrick. As Big Daryl drove slowly down a street that was lined with boarded-up dingy, dingy storefronts, 